Welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm Nadine Blaney from AusBiz, and you are watching this event at a time of, you know, really fascination when it comes to what's going on in gl the global atmosphere, when it goes on uh, to what's going on in economics as well, and all of it is impacting global capital markets. So we have very quickly evolving situations when it comes to geopolitics and economics and potential political change, and that includes overseas and both here at home as well. So all of this is changing what's happening in financial markets. And that means that traders and investors alike are having to really respond to risk. Um, so there is huge uncertainty coming from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We've got China's economy slowing. We have an indebted Australian uh, households, and we've got the potential for rising interest rates as well. And we did have what some are calling an inflationary budget being handed down last night. So how will Australians cope with rising inflation? How will they cope with rising rates? And of course, what does this all mean for, for traders, investors, and the whole suite of market participants? So to help make sense of all of that, and it's a big task, Pepperstone has put together you know, an absolutely fantastic panel. So we do welcome Bob Carr, foreign minister, former foreign minister for Australia, also the longest serving premier in New South Wales, a former head of the Australia-China Relations Institute at the uh, University of Technology in Sydney and current head of industry, professor of industry there as well. And we have Stephen Kukoulis, who is managing director of market economics. Um, he was former advisor on economics to Prime Minister Julia Gillard. And we've also got Pete Wargent, who's joining us here. So expert in all things property and um, also co-founder of buyersbuyers.com. So gentlemen, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Pleasure. Thank Good you. evening. Yeah. Um, Bob Carr, I may start with you. You've met the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. When he invaded the Ukraine, could you believe that that's what he had chosen to do? Could you believe that uh, that was how things were destined to be? I observed him close up at the 2013 G20. I was representing Australia because Kevin Rudd was fighting an election campaign. Um, and I observed him handle, he chaired the meeting as the host. Obama was pressing very hard to get the G20 to endorse retaliatory strikes against Assad in Syria because of his chemical weapons use. Putin in the chair allowed the debate to play out over a drawn out banquet in the Peterhof Palace. And at the very end, Putin closed the discussion by saying two things. He read from the Pope's letter, which said there was no just war argument for, for retaliatory strikes. And he said, I want to read what, a, what someone campaigning for the Senate from Illinois said some years ago about another war in the Middle East. And without saying he was quoting a younger Barack Obama, he read what Obama had said in a speech opposing the invasion of Iraq. And I thought, I have just seen a performance by a very deft, very accomplished political operator. Putin allowed the meeting to close at that point, at quarter to one in the morning, and we all went off. But in what he's done, there is no hint of that deafness. This is a brutal act and a high risk act that endangers him in a way nothing else he could have done might have endangered his continued domination of the politics of Russia. What is his end game there? Well, this is why it's so difficult. It's clouded. Is it, is it regime change in Kyiv? Which would, which would mandate very clearly a continuing Russian military presence and Russia saying to the people of Ukraine, the people of the world, we will intervene if you ever elect an anti-Russian president, an anti-Russian government. That's the boldest possible intervention, carving off large parts of territory. For example, the area in the east of Ukraine, not just the area occupied by pro-Russian separatists, but the entirety of those two provinces. But he's kept his war aims clouded, which gives us some hope at this point that among the possible outcomes is a swift diplomatic solution that would see Ukraine say, OK, we'll never join NATO, but we reserve our right to join the EU. And as much as I want to choke in saying this, some territorial adjustment. The US President Joe Biden tweeted <clears throat> the other day that 
Russia's economy was ranked 11th biggest economy in the world, and it will soon not even rank amongst the top 20 in the world. That was the tweet coming from the American president. But Russia is still a nuclear power. Russia still has commodities that the world needs and demands. Was the West reckless in not providing Russian President Vladimir Putin with some sort of an off-ramp early on, just before the invasion, or even some sort of golden bridge now? If we, if we want to explore history, I'd go back even further. I'd say that the West, the leadership of the West, especially the White House, appeared to be asleep at the wheel in the 90s when it lazily allowed an expansion of NATO, that is NATO being rolled up to the very borders of the truncated Russia that emerged from the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so Russia was democratizing throughout the 1990s. Its politics wasn't deformed by the outrageous nationalism we've since seen. There was a chance of creating a new security structure in Europe that accommodated Russia and let it down to its diminished role with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 mm -hmm. we, we, with a relatively gentle touch. We didn't take that. We allowed NATO to expand to its very borders and ignored the voice, the voices of very wise people in the West, Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the US Senate and, and uh, George Kennan, the great diplomatist of, uh, of America, who said it is wrong. I think even Kissinger. It is wrong to look at an expansion of NATO. Ukraine should be Finlandized, that is kept neutral and out of the EU and out of NATO. Um, as a result, we faced a nationalist backlash in Russia. I've got to say immediately, this, lest these remarks be misinterpreted, none of this justifies a, an invasion of the Ukraine across internationally recognized borders, a trampling on the sovereignty of a free and independent people. Yeah. Where's China right now in all of this? I think, I think quite possibly regretful for the open-ended statement that Xi Jinping concluded with Putin this year, um, talking about the partnership between the two nations in relatively extravagant language. China has sent some careful diplomatic signals by abstaining in the Security Council and in the important resolution in the General Assembly, and by allowing, for example, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, in which China is the biggest shareholder, to go along with sanctions uh, directed at China. On the other hand, China can't turn its back on a country with whom it upgraded relations when America said, as it did, four years ago, we now see China as a, as, a, as, a, as a strategic rival, in other words, as an adversary. China went off and upgraded its relations with, with Russia, which it otherwise would not have done. It can't be too brutal in turning its back on Russia. When we think of geopolitics, when we think of China, we immediately think of Taiwan. Has China's view on potentially um, getting involved with Taiwan, invading Taiwan, taking over Taiwan. Has that changed now that it sees the West's swift, sharp reaction in terms of sanctions, economic sanctions to Russia? I think the first thing to say is that uh, any prospect of a China move on Taiwan would not have taken off, was not going to take off until the second part of the 2020s. It, it's then that they would have gained a more comfortable military position facing American forces in the uh, in the Pacific. Um, I think both both Ch both on the Chinese side and on the American side, you've seen a move beyond the what's known as the cross cross strait status quo, uh, the diplomatic language, the polite lies that have kept the peace over Taiwan for the last fifty years. Both sides have crossed red lines that are recognized as important by the other side. Mm -hmm. I would be guessing that at this time, there is some high level diplomacy between Yang Yechi, the senior Chinese diplomat and government spokesman on these matters, and Kurt Campbell, the president's, President Biden's East Asian envoy, to, to have a pullback from 
the, 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 the fairly tense situation that has existed. Uh, but without a doubt, the, the question you raise is spot on. China would be following very closely how a united West and a resistant Ukraine has responded to a brutal invasion that the invader had assumed would be over in a flash. Mm -hmm. Sanctions. Well, Stephen, let's just start with um, outflows that we've seen from Chinese government bonds. Yes. Do you think that that is a recognition of increased sovereign risk in China because of its ambitions, its growing sphere of influence in, uh, in geopolitics, given its support of Russia? Yeah, the, the sanction model that is impacting Russia right now and causing its economy to have a, an almighty recession or depression even. You know, GDP is going to be minus 15% or, or thereabouts, I think, on the latest reading because of the sanctions that are being imposed. I don't think that model applies quite so easily to China. China's multiple times the size of, of Russia and the dependence on the rest of the world and particularly the Western economies on China for their exports, for direct investment from large multinationals. And of course, as a supplier of uh, low-cost manufactured goods it means that if we imposed uh, sanctions on China in the event of an escalation of any conflict between China and Taiwan, we would have uh, we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot even more than some companies and some countries have already with the Russian issue. So I think it's going to be slightly different. Nonetheless, I think prudent governments, prudent policymakers, and this has come up several times here in Australia. Are we? over-reliant on China? Should we be looking to diversify our exports away from China? You know, something close to 40% of all of our merchandise exports go to China. And uh, first of all, we thought that if China had an economic downturn, it would hurt us. But if there's a geopolitical blow up, if we can call it that, that would hurt us as well, not just from our exports, but our ability to import the things that we use every day. Is that arguably, has that already happened to some extent? I'd be interested to get Bob's take on that because um, previously, uh, particularly over the past decade, international students, mainly from China, uh, tourists, um, it was previously New Zealand, then it was all from China. Yep. Um, permanent migrants were mainly from India and China. Obviously, for various reasons, a lot of this has stopped. Um, international students have largely come back, but not the Chinese students. Chinese tourism, tourism hasn't happened again yet. Mm. Permanent migrants, the same. Is, is that a, a shift in the relationship between the two countries? Because pre-COVID and maybe sort of five or 10 years ago is all going in the direction of, you know, China taking over almost in terms of being a key, you know, key export partner. But is that relationship now soured or changed? Well, it's a bit of a contradiction. Yeah. I think um, the share of our exports that goes to China mm. is still high. That, that Mm. The last figures I've seen, it hasn't come back. Mm. That might reflect um, iron, iron oil prices. <laughs> but we, we, the, the idea of diversification, I went, when I got my rapid antigen test and, uh, and opened it, the package, um, the first thing I noticed is it was made in China. Mm. It was made in China. Mm. So all, all the rhetoric about us um, uh, addressing supply chain mm. dependency, supply chain dependency mm. is, is a lot of hot air to a large extent. If someone's got a contract, if an Australian exporter has got a fruitful yeah. contact, uh, contract with a buyer in China, you can't have uh, the <laughs> government department in Canberra ring them up and say, look, we, no we noticed that you're making five million this year from export the Export to Indonesia instead yeah. or something. <laughs> and we think you should export somewhere else. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the exporter would say, well, hang on, my my wine market has been doing very, very well, thank yeah. you. And yeah. Indonesia and India are teetotaler <laughs> nations. Um, so, um, We've lost markets because the, the Chinese wanted to send a message back to us about the tilt in our policy, but they've been picked up by other Western allies, mm -hmm. um, uh, by America itself. Um, there's not much we can do about it, but I, I think I think you expand economic opportunities where you can. Mm -hmm. Of course, yep. you want diversification, but, but um, India's model, for example, of economic development is going to be very different from China's. They're not going to be sucking in Australian exports the way China did. And it's hard to find a substitute for the things that we yeah. manage with the Chinese. And we have supply chains, to your point, it's not just the exports, it's the imports. I yes. mean, we would be incapable of replacing 
uh, many, many um, inputs into even potentially what we would be able to manufacture here if there yeah. were sanctions against China. I mean, it's a whole but different ballgame. It, it's completely different because that import reliance is also important. That yes, the supply chain problems. Uh, if you tried sort of buying a new car recently, you've got to wait, and that's you know, there's a few different issues of why that's the case. But the ability of us to function as an economy if we don't have that imported. Uh, inputs into the manufacturing process is is huge. So even steel that we import, you export the iron ore and the coal, and, well, we used to export the coal, uh, but now we're sort of um, importing the, the made products, which is an important issue too. So that that trade link is, is important. And every month we get the international trade numbers. We're running massive monthly surpluses now, and it's predominantly with China. They're the driver, and as Bob was alluding to, that we've not had any pullback in the uh, export flows to China because of iron ore and, and other commodities as well, it must be noted. But um, so that trade link, it's fantastic news while it continues. Mm -hmm. So just bringing it back to Russia, Ukraine for a bit, Stephen, in your opinion, is it the inflationary pressures that are yeah. most uh, you know, negative for Australia right now emanating out of that particular conflict? Oh, no, no doubt. Obviously, the um, immoral actions that are going on there are indisputable. There's no discussion about that. But there are financial market and economic consequences from what's going on. We know that already energy prices have been booming as a result of the disruptions to supply. Uh, that's having an impact on how we consumers are functioning, how businesses are operating. The cost of transport is going up and that's feeding into end inflation numbers. So when we look around the world, it was, it was happening before you know, the Russia-Ukraine issue. There was an acceleration in inflation. Bond markets were selling off interest rate hiking expectations were being built in or actually acted upon in, in some countries, that we were having this uh, discussion about inflation lifting. Now, the Ukraine issue has just added to a rising inflation problem at the wrong time of the cycle. I'm not going to say if it happened a couple of years ago when we had very low inflation, we might not have the same problems. But with the economy around the world pretty strong, with monetary policy settings around the world very stimulatory and fiscal policy settings extraordinarily um, stimulatory around the world. No wonder inflation was lifting. We've just had this geopolitical overlay, uh, seeing inflation rates hit the highest level in 30 or 40 years. And we had a, well, did we have an inflationary budget here in Australia? Oh, look, night? yes, the short answer is yes. Um, we've got a stimulus occurring in fiscal policy. You know, the, the petrol tax has been reduced uh, for six months, admittedly. It's not there forever. There's cash being given to pensioners and to sort of low and middle income earners. And, and even infrastructure, while I'm a massive fan of infrastructure spending usually, there, will we have the workers to be able to build the dams and build the roads? Because they're already tied up building houses and other non-residential areas. Not just areas. that, workers so, for cybersecurity, well, workers well, in well, the all, tech space, all of workers the above. anywhere. No, then you nailed that because we, we're running at full capacity. And the unemployment rate, sub 4%, which is inevitable in the next few months, and some smart people out there, some of my friends are forecasting a three and a quarter, not three and three quarters, a three and a quarter unemployment rate. Every business that I've spoken to in the last three to six months can't find staff or they're having to pay up to attract staff or they're poaching the competitive staff, offering them 10% more and they're paying bonuses and incentives to stay. So if you stay with me, I'll give you some more money. Okay, that's not showing up in the one of the worst economic indicators that I think we've got in Australia, the wage price index. I think that's a really poor indicator of wage pressures because household incomes, this is the point that even Josh Frydenberg was trying to make. I don't think he did it terribly well last night in the budget, but um, labour costs are going up a lot. Take-home pay is going up. It's not showing up in that wage price index. It's showing up in the fact that people getting a promotion are getting ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year more. And that is going to be recouped from businesses by putting up their selling prices, which is inflation. Inflationary. Now, whoa, who do I go to? Is the RBA <laughs> behind the curve? How far, should we say, is the RBA behind the curve? I, I'm leaning towards patience. I've seen what market pricing, 3.1% by, by August 2023. 2023. Yeah. If that happens, I'll personally buy Stephen a bottle of Penfold's Grange uh, Hermitage. Uh, I, You're I, on I, really <laughs> I, I don't think we, we're going to see that. Um, but if I mean you can't ignore futures markets. I mean yeah, I think the you know a lot of analysts are now looking at August, September, October, November for hikes this year. That sounds like a reasonable sort of trajectory. I'm interested to know, Steve. We, we were chatting just before, 
I, mean, I was saying, if you went to the University of Canberra and he gave the students an economics paper and he said, headline inflation inflation's three and a half, unemployment's going to 50 year lows, what would you expect the cash rate to be? And what kind of budget deficit or surplus would you expect? <laughs> 10 basis points on the cash rate, three and a half percent deficit on the budget. But what would you yeah. actually, uh, what would you have, we've seen all your hot takes online about the budget, but what would you have liked to have seen a, a oh. less stimulatory budget? Yeah, and, and I'll answer that by looking at what the RBA and governments did when we had two major economic shocks to the economy. The global financial crisis, which is still an important lesson on how to manage uh, a shock to the Australian economy, and of course the COVID recession of the last two years. Both arms of policy, if we can call it that, fiscal policy, we saw pump priming, big budget deficits, and the rule book about balancing budgets, all these things went out the window, and rightly so. We saw central banks do, and the Reserve Bank of Australia do things that I couldn't have imagined, a 0.1% cash rate, a term funding facility for the banks, quantitative easing, buying bonds in, they always bought bonds, but in massive quantities, I should say. So they worked together to support the economy, cap the rise in the unemployment rate mm. and stop deflation becoming entrenched. Fast forward to the start of 2022, where we are right now. And as you said, an unemployment rate about to hit a 50-year low, inflation about, well, potentially in headline terms to hit a 30-year high. Uh, and we've got a 0.1% cash rate. Mm. And we've got the budget having a stimulatory effect, a budget deficit that's still 70-odd billion dollars, still 3.5% of GDP. Come on, we've got to work together to contain inflation because you know runaway inflation is very, very hard to contain. I think well, as, it, uh, as it relates to housing, I think there's a couple more things coming. Rents are rising quite quickly now. Yes. Um, we've got vacancy rates. The figures will be out tomorrow, nearest the lowest in 20 years. Um, quite counterintuitively, given the lack of uh, open borders over the past two years, uh, but also building materials. Costs are absolutely you know, they've really shot up. Uh, we've seen construction insolvencies, ProBuild, Condev, mm -hmm. there's more in the post. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on that sector of the economy as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, those, the inflation numbers, you know, we've got petrol prices that we've talked about, but there's, there's stuff coming through from housing as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why do you still think that the RBA would be so patient? I just think we've got a different inflation profile. This is now contrarian view these days. Um, <laughs> but if you look at where the inflation has come from in the UK, United States, um, uh, household uh, energy prices have absolutely rocketed in yeah. some of those countries. Not quite the same here. Also, goods inflation has been very, very rapid overseas less so in Australia. I think we'll see a trimmed mean print for the next quarter of about 1%. So that'll take us to the top of the band, but we're not absolutely running away like in some of the other parts of the world. Would the RBA, would the RBA hike in an election cycle? What, what do they, you think? Well, uh, they, they did in the past. Glenn Stevens, when he was governor in 2007, much to Peter Costello, who was treasurer at the time, was uh, most affronted. And Glenn... Uh, as governor said, it'd be remiss of me to not do my job just because there's an election campaign. You know, we don't have our soldiers not, not fighting a war. We don't have our nurses not looking after people. They're public servants. You know, why should I do anything different? And, and he was, and Glenn Stevens was quite right. We had an inflation issue. I won't call it a problem. We had an inflation issue yet. And to delay it would have compounded the inflation risks down the track. So would they hike? Um, they, they may. Well, the interesting thing will be on the 27th of April when we get the March quarter CPI. Pete's sort mm -hmm. of saying we're only get the trim lead at 1% for the quarter. I won't buy you a bottle of grain because <laughs> like there's a risk of might be on the low a little side. bit lower. Upside but, risk. Yeah. But there is massive upside risk. Mm -hmm. You know, the the food prices are elevated. I know it's March quarter. And it's only mm -hmm. we've been noticing now that cauliflowers are $8 each and these sorts of things are occurring. But it's really that the uh, the price pressures, the underlying price pressures were, were evident in the March quarter. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a, you know, 1.3, 1.4 trimmed mean, which gets us towards three and a half. And the other thing, if you annualise the last two quarters, and sorry to torture the data here, but if you annualise <laughs> the last two quarters, so the last six months, you'll be getting an annualised rate around about four and a four half percent, mm. give or take. Well, we know that QT will be talked about in May, but bringing it back to housing, because we love housing, yes. um, what happens to Australian households in this inflationary environment if rates do go up? I mean, rates might go up 25, 50 to oh, 1%. I mean, 3% in 2023, 
If that does seem unplausible to you, what happens when well, rate goes up? I don't think we'll see a 3% cash rate. I think um, one of the things is we've got massive buffers. So the average mortgage, and I know averages can distort individual circumstances, but it, it's quite a uniquely Australian situation, the use of mortgage buffers and redraw facilities and so on and offset accounts. The average mortgage is two years ahead. Uh, we've also got um, an ex excess savings for households of about $250 billion through the pandemic. So households are sitting on half a trillion dollars of cash. We've never seen anything like that before, cash and deposits. Um, so look, I think a cash rate going from zero to one is not going to move the needle too much. The most interest rate sensitive sectors of the market will probably be Sydney and Melbourne, big mortgages in those cities. Um, I think the, 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 the market can absorb a 1% cash rate fine. 3%, that's a whole other question. Mortgages are now being assessed with a 300 basis points buffer, new, new loans. Uh, so in theory, households should be able to absorb that. But think of all that cash being sucked out of the economy. I, I just, I'm seeing the terminal cash rate at one and a half. Don't hold me to it, but I can't see 3%. What happens to the economy at one and a half percent? Oh, it's still it's still growing. And, it, and taking a step back, the RBA would not hike to one and a half if the economy was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want to cause a recession. It doesn't want to cause a hard landing. And again, one of the lessons of this last year or two uh, was the embracing of an, an employment target from both the RBA and the government. They said, we want to get unemployment to four percent. Um They've got that and now they've reassessed it. We want to get it to three and a half. And I think that's fantastic. I think we should be really happy that we've got an unemployment rate that anyone born before 1974 has not seen. You know, it's, it's amazing. And that's good news on the economy. So the RBA in hiking aren't mean, they're aren't, not nasty. They're trying to maintain a uh, relatively low and steady inflation rate so that cost of living pressures don't hurt people. But you know, inflation is a bad thing. And so the rate hiking cycle to me seems to be one where we could easily see, say, two and a half percent. And that would occur because we do have fully employed, a fully employed workforce. We do have wages growth increasing. So in the steady state of uh, nothing changing, you just slap on a 250 basis point or even 300 basis points of rate hikes onto the household debt numbers, well, the incomes are going to be changing over the next 18 months. Household incomes will probably going to be rising 10% over the next two years. So that's going to help those people service a mortgage with rates 100, 150, 200 basis points higher. So well, it's not going to be nice, but good economic management doesn't always mean giving people money. Well, that's a change from the past yeah, few yeah, years. <laughs> Um, Bob Carr, you, you, it's brought, been brought up demographic trends, migration in the budget last night. I believe we are forecasting net migration to return to 235,000 per year by 2025. I know in the past that you've talked about Australia's carrying capacity. Uh, is there still a debate to be had about whether immigration levels should be, you know, running at, at such high, high levels? Yeah, that, that, that is high. It's historically high. Um, I drove through Alexandria in Sydney a few days ago, and I'd never, I'd never been down that street. I never saw such a dense forest of towers. If someone had told Australians 20 years ago that, that something, something even more dense than what you'd find in a Hong Kong uh, housing estate would be um, part of the architectural linger franca of of uh, Sydney, they would have been astonished. They would have been in denial. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong. As a former planning minister, higher densities near along rail lines, along along bus routes, um, around rail stations, in particular, close to the inner city, makes sense. The best way of housing people, an alternative to urban sprawl. But I think a majority of Australians would agree with me when I say that that. Um, when things return to normal, now, now we're making up for uh, acute, we're trying to deal with acute labour shortages in many areas, but when things return to normal, these are still very ambitious targets. And you are asking people in the three big cities, the three big capital cities, to accept a change in the way they live their lives that a majority of them would say is a bit unfair. The nature of our economy is changing. We're no longer pumping in workers to, to build cars and work in steel mills. Um, and I think it's reasonable to say, do we want immigration at these levels or, or going along at about half the rate 
when things return to normal, when we relieve the labour shortages that have, have been so uh, acute in the last two and a half years, I think that's a reasonable debate to have. Pete, we mentioned infrastructure. We did see spending for infrastructure. Can infrastructure keep up reasonably with that level of net migration? Well, probably not. If you, if you add 235,000 plus, you've got the natural growth mm. of the population. Uh, people are living longer, so births minus deaths. That's, that's taking you to 400,000. In global terms for a developed economy, that's very hot. Now, uh, in FY21, we saw something that we haven't seen since 1981, and that is actually the regions growing faster than the capital cities. 60,000 drop in Melbourne's population. Sydney fell by 5,000, though you probably wouldn't have noticed it. Um, so, But that's, that's a, a bit of a blip. Usually, demographic patterns are new migrants, like myself, go to Sydney and Melbourne in that order. Internally, people move to southeast Queensland. I think 400,000, as Bob said, we've been through that. Through the mining boom years, there might have been a period where it was justified because we actually needed the labour. But I think, to be fair, we did get pretty lazy. We were just going for headline numbers, headline GDP, bringing a lot of young people. But did we need such a high rate of population growth? It did nothing for wages growth, obviously. Yeah. And I think one of the issues... Uh, that, that's occurred during this two years where we've had zero immigration, in fact, slightly negative, and more people leaving than have been coming into Australia, is that that's been one of the reasons why unemployment rate has surprised everybody by falling so much. So when firms have Good been point, doing that's okay, often overlooked. Yeah, mm. firms have been mm. doing okay, I'm expanding, I need to hire some stuff, I'm going to get someone from the pool of the unemployed or people who were underemployed, they had a job that were working not optimal hours, they were given more hours. And we've had that really good scenario unfolding as well. So in addition to infrastructure and congestion type issues with literally a million people coming to Australia in two or three years or our population increasing by that much, it does have macroeconomic consequences for the labour market as well. And my view, we've already been talking about red wine already. I look at immigration like red wine. You know, there's an optimal amount you should have. A little bit's nice, too much causes a hangover. And pre-COVID, we had too much. And we had a hangover in terms of congestion. We hadn't invested enough in uh, transport infrastructure in the big cities. Uh, and even what you might term social infrastructure. So there were there were suburbs being developed in the in the outer rings of the big cities, but they had poor or poor transport. They were a long way from schools. They were a long way from people's work. They didn't have great shops. So living there was not really desirable because I couldn't get my kids to school easily. I can't get to the yeah. shops yeah, easily. The secret and is so infrastructure it, it, never catches up. Yes, uh, the, yes. The population growth is always ahead of the available infrastructure. State governments have yeah. been, yeah. been setting, every state government sets a record in real spending on infrastructure. Um, but if you're pumping in immigration at that high level, um, as Peter says, adding a city the size of Canberra to every, the city's yeah. population every year, yeah. Yeah. Um, no government can keep up. No government could keep up. Great things are happening with infrastructure. In Sydney, the expansion of the metro is terrific. Yeah. And along the metro line, you can put high density towers. People don't need a car. They come down each morning, mm -hmm. leave in a train. They get access across the regions of Sydney in a way that was never possible without that metro link. Metro system is fantastic. But um, I, I, I think the, the drastic change, what I saw in Alexandria, where everyone's looking into one another's bedroom from a, a high rise tower, is probably not the healthiest environment for a, uh, a nation um, that, that's got the highest urbanisation rates in the world. We, we, we have got, as Peter says, we have had the highest immigration, the, the highest population growth rate of any developed country. Yeah. If we see a change in government at the next election, will thinking around migration and immigration levels change? I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I tend to be one out arguing this line within the Labor Party. Um, um, there are sceptics about super high immigration, but in the end, uh, Canberra prevails. And, and the uh, rich irony we got here is that Canberra, which has got less less population pressure than any capital in Australia, yeah. um, uh, and, you know, the only traffic jam is on the way to Canberra Airport on at the end of the <laughs> sitting week. Um, um, it's got the lowest population densities of any city in Australia, the luxury of unimpeded suburban living. Um, Canberra sets the rates 
that Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane have got to live with. You're a Canberrian, aren't you? Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's um, a bit of a sore point. No, no, yeah. no, but, but, but you're, you're, you're right. And the well, and to give credit to the, um, the local government, uh, the uh, Territory government, they've got a really good policy because it was the sprawl was a bit too sprawly. Mm. So in mm. the last decade or so, they've tried to infill a little bit in some of the sort of parklands. The bush capital is still very much a bush capital, but they've mm. built the light rail with apartments along Northbourne Avenue. For those of you who know Canberra, yeah. there are a lot of apartments that are extending that down to Woden. So to give a bit of an ad here for Canberra, but it's not a bad place. <laughs> and they're sort of doing it reasonably well. But that said, there are still new suburbs being built. Whitlam's the latest one that's been You, you increase in. population at the rate we've seen and the city goes up and it goes out. Yeah. And major, the majority of Australians would agree with the, what seems to be the consensus on this panel that we can achieve the benefits of immigration by a less ambitious rate. Mm-hmm. I think one of the uh, conundrums is we've we've had no immigration for two years. Uh, we had the home builder stimulus, all those detached homes being built around yes. the country, and yet rental vacancies are now at nearly at the lowest level in 20 years. That's really counterintuitive. I think there's been a, a literal race for space. You know, people have been heading to the regions, buying second homes, buying coastal properties, <laughs> yes. um, vacancies in the inner city. Uh, so it hasn't done much for the rental stock. Now, you, you start tipping in, you know, the international students are coming back, but then you start getting uh, tourism and then permanent migration. We're not building the high-rise towers at the same rate that we were years ago, the ones that uh-huh. were mentioned in Alexandria, partly because Chinese investors, well, we've, we've taxed them out of the market. Um, I did mention a potential change in government. Uh, back to speaking about China, Bob, do you think that a change in government would bring about a, a rethink in the relationship with China? In a word, no. I wouldn't bet on that. I think the, uh, the Andy Albanese-led Labour opposition uh, and Penny Wong have been at pains to say there's no difference between us and the government on China policy. I would think the government, a new government, would be working overtime to send a message of continuity about China. They'd be doing that because they're in conversation with our American allies. Um, they, they know that on this issue, conservative media in Australia is looking very closely at what they're doing. And the third pressure is the own, uh, the, their own security, national security establishment in Canberra. I think they'll be at pains to say, no, there's continuity on China policy. You might argue, someone might argue that a lot of the talk on China from Prime Minister Morrison, Defence Minister Dutton has been pretty loose. Um, It's been a long way from being diplomatic language. Um, And it could well be that the change of government, um, the more conservative instincts of Penny Wong and Annie Albanese result in, in more diplomatic speeches and media commentary. But Continuity will be the theme. Um, The the test is whether Australia, under a coalition government or a Labor government, can return to some sort of dialogue with China. At the present time, we can't get meetings. Um, If Scott Morrison gets back, I think there'll be some in the government likely to argue, Prime Minister, at the very least, we ought to be aiming to get a conversation between Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, and our foreign minister, um, even in the even in the in the fringes of a, a summit, um, Asian in, uh, an East Asia summit or uh, APEC or some other meeting, and maybe just possible down the track if they get talking, a meeting between you and the Chinese leader, uh, even in the margins of an international summit or at a an annual General Assembly meeting. But that's the most we could expect. So I don't see a shift. I think Australia is probably in a position where there's only going to be um, a healthier bilateral relationship with China when when you see, if you see, an American collaboration with China on areas of international policy like pandemic management and climate and perhaps some other things, and perhaps a better understanding between the two giants over cross-straits relations in respect of Taiwan. If there's a change in government, how do you think the economic 
policy landscape will yeah. change? Because we haven't yeah. heard a lot. We haven't heard a lot. No, I think that's been um, a deliberate strategy from uh, Albo, Albo and uh, Jim Chalmers that they're wanting to be not seen to be having the big target. They they learned a lesson, whether it was the right, right lesson, I'm not sure, from the 2019 election, which they unexpectedly lost with negative gearing and franking credits, something dear to every, many people's hearts. Uh, so I think economic policy is going to be, uh, there'll be some slight changes in terms of uh, the emphasis that are put on things. Things like uh, affordable and accessible childcare is something that's important for workforce participation uh, and therefore productivity as, as an economic reform, not a social welfare issue. Things like education, skills and training is something that's still important. Mm -hmm. you know, here we are saying, isn't it wonderful we've got a you know, 3.5% unemployment rate uh, down the track. That's still around about 550 or 600,000 people. And there's always going to be a bit of frictional unemployment, but let's make sure that they've got the skills and training needed to uh, adapt to a hopefully a growing economy over the next few years. So skills and training are going to be an important part of economic policy to me. There may be a few little tweaks on taxes and these sorts of things, but I don't think there's going to be any wholesale change. I don't think we're going to see a, a rapid move to repair the budget. They might at the margin just sort of mm -hmm. trim a bit here and do a little bit uh, in terms of some of the spending ideas that they currently don't like. But Economics won't change. They're, they're, one, one, one interesting thing, and again, this is a well, whoever wins the election, they're going to have a uh, review of the Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know the terms of reference yet, uh, but given how poorly the RBA has done in the last five or six years, I think that's long overdue. And uh, that'll be interesting to see whether they actually do anything material there, which could actually influence financial markets if they change the inflation target, if they include a more... Um, uh, definitive target for unemployment or wages. You know, I'm not quite sure what will be in the in the remit in terms of reviewing the RBA, but you know that that could be an issue that uh, will be a market driver post election. And Pete, the changes to negative gearing, dead and buried. Uh, well, in fact, Albert had an interview about a week ago, and he said keep it. Um, of course, that doesn't preclude changes later. Uh, we actually saw this in the United Kingdom. And actually under a conservative government, they restricted tax deductibility on landlords' properties over there. The world kept turning. Um, I think they probably won't touch it. Likewise, franking credits for the reasons that Stephen mentioned, smaller target. I think um, Labour will take some housing policies to the election, social housing fund, um, some support for regional first home buyers. Uh, but these are not big ticket items mm -hmm. that move the needle. I think the macro mm -hmm. environment will be much more important than the actual political policies. And, and Bob, will the conversation around debt and deficit change at all if there were a change in government? Um, I think I think Labor governments are always on the defensive, e e even if they, e even if the the Conservative government they've replaced has been very, shall we say, exuberant <laughs> when it comes to borrowing and the deficit. Uh, Labor governments always feel they're on the defensive on economic management. Um, so, and, 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 and if the Conservatives are translated to opposition um, in the manner of politicians at all times and in all places, they, they'll quickly relegate their record on borrowing big during the COVID crisis um, and um, running big deficits and turn on labour. Um, so th th that, that debate goes on. Uh, the substantial worry I've got on this front is the blowout in borrowings and what it means, especially on state budgets, when inflation moves upwards and interest rates move up as well. Um, uh, state budgets have been, state, state, state uh, borrowings have been downgraded um, by the ratings agencies. The state budgets have been downgraded. And any rise in interest rates are going to leave the fragility are going to see the emergence of somewhat fragile balance sheets. Um, and you're going to see one of those cyclical turns in politics where all of a sudden it becomes, after periods of very heavy borrowing, when everyone says borrowing big is fine for infrastructure or keeping the economy moving, you're going to see a new virtue about winding back debt. Interest rates. But we have a lot of the debt, the national debt, locked in at very, very low rates now. I mean, we do. Why does it matter? Uh, because that debt is still rolled over at some point. Now, the interesting benchmark for that is, and we saw that in the budget papers last night, the 
24, 5, 25, 26, I can't remember which financially it was, there was a, a rise in the public debt interest costs. The, the government's got to pay interest on its debt. And yes, some of the debt that was issued 10 years ago as a 10-year bond had a yield of 4%. And even now it's being rolled over into 3%, give or take. So you're actually getting a lower funding cost. However, there was a lot of debt issued in the last three years at, well, some of it 0.1% for yeah. the three-year bonds at the RBA, hoovered up. Um, and a lot of 10-year bonds even were at point nine at the low point of the cycle. Now, they don't mature for a while. And in a sense, this is what people call the ticking time bomb, that it's not going to impact anything tomorrow or the next year or even the year after that. But if we're continuing to run significant budget deficits, if we're adding to the borrowing uh, levels, and we do get a structural rise in interest rates being locked in, not just a cycle up and then in two years' time, we're going to be back down to 1% again, then of course, your public debt interest cost does increase. And that's the issue that I think will, will will be there in the future. It's not here now or even next year, but as a lot of the debt that was issued in these incredibly low interest rate times matures, and a lot of it's the 25 and 28 debt, so it matures in the next four or five years, that's going to be the, the challenge for managing the budget. Okay, we are just about out of time, but um, let's just put in our mind that this becomes an annual event that Pepperstone puts on. Pete, where will we be this time next year? in terms of interest rates, in terms of household debts, in terms of health amongst the Australian, let's say, homeowner? Um, well, firstly, I think I think we'll see a change of government. When you, when you get a government that's very long in the tooth and you have a recession, cost of living pressures, I reckon you're gone. That's the first, first thing. Um, so uh, I think the policies, as Steve mentioned, will be quite similar. I think we'll, if it's a year's time, the cash rate will be one to one and a half. I think... Um, the, the Reserve Bank will be forced to start tightening, but I think it will be gradual and measured and patient. That's my view. So I don't think a lot of the doomsday scenarios that we see out there, I don't think they will come to pass. Unemployment's lowest we've seen in half a century. Wages are rising gradually. Um, so I, I think it will be a bit of a, a bit of a fizzer. You know, people always like these big, you know, you know grand statements about uh, the end of the world coming, but I think it'll be a, a, a relatively smooth journey. And Stephen, I mean, inflation in a year, what does it look yeah. like? Because we don't know where the end point, it, it's very hard to see the end point right now. Yeah, it, well, in underlying terms, because the price of petrol is one of the ones that drive the headline figure. And if we do go back to you know, the global price going to $90 a barrel, then the headline CPI in a year's time will be falling or will be weaker because of that fall. Look, I think uh, underlying inflation trim means going to be three to three and a half persistently. I think the wage side is is coming through quite clearly and quite strongly, and uh, particularly if we see the unemployment rate falling. And my, my favourite market uh, observation right now is how cheap the Aussie dollar is at 75 cents, there or thereabouts. Commodity prices are booming. We're running a massive current account surplus. Uh, we've got the RBA uh, the reason why the Aussie dollar hasn't risen earlier, I think, is because the RBA has been holding back its rate hikes when the rest of the world's been hiking. If the RBA catch up post-election um, and even with a relatively measured tightening cycle, I think all of a sudden we'll get this Aussie dollar moving higher very, very sharply. That's one thing that I think will be a really interesting thing. And it may even, it, when we get to 80 or if we get to 80, 85 cents in, in six and 12 months' time, it might become an issue for many exporters and it might become an issue for the RBA but that's this time next year. This time next year Bob Carr will this east west divide be more entrenched is this the start and I don't want to be you know too verbose or too over stating it but is there sort of a new world order in a way taking hold right now? No no I think I'd back some sort of revert to normal, to normal conditions. It very often happens in, in human affairs after a shock that we think is going to radically change things for a long time to come. Um, for example, I think, I think there are strong reasons for both China and to America and, and for America to pull back from one another's red lines over Taiwan and behind the scenes to cool it, to cool it. I think, I think China will be seeking to send some sophisticated messages um, about how it's not locked in behind its new best friend, uh, Putin's Russia. It's harder to tip what happens in Ukraine, but the odds are 
are probably on some diplomatic settlement that will nonetheless see a stronger NATO organising to contain Russia and a, a pretty grumpy Russia, but still a Russia that would be celebrating the return, some adjustment in borders and a guarantee that Ukraine was not about to sign up to NATO. As far as we can look through a glass darkly, um, that is, I think, quite a, pre a credible attempt to predict how things might stand. Um, the question is, America's, does America feel so challenged by Russia that it sees some virtue in expanding, not greatly, not dramatically, but areas, nonetheless expanding some areas of cooperation with China? And does China feel that its assertiveness of recent years has gone too far and there's something to be said for detente with the US? Let's leave it at that, shall we? <laughs> Pete Wargent, buyerswires.com, Stephen Kukoulis, Market Economics, and Bob Carr, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you all for watching.